Hello, book two. I have a little Thursday mail for you here uh, in, on a, a bright sunny day. The, the storms of yesterday dissipated. Uh, the heat hasn't quite dissipated, but I'm not looking forward to it going. I'm looking forward to it going because of Frida, because it bothers her. But I'm not looking forward to it going on its own, because the, one of these times in late August or early September, the heat is going to go away and it's not going to come back for seven months. So, uh, uh, But anyway, we have a small package of books here. We end in uh, in a box, a nice heavy box. Could be a, a big finished copy. Uh, so there should be something in here that are worth getting out of bed for. <laughs> uh, let's see the first one. Oh, oh, very good. Okay, is this a 2020 book? Yes, it is. Okay. This is from uh, the Penguin Random House Young Readers series, but it's a it's a ambitious thing. It's YA history. Uh, this this is what it is. Flowers in the gutter. This is a, an illustrated cover. Look at that. You have uh, I don't know if you can make it out, but you have France in the background there, and you have the action on the cover looks to be that a young boy wearing a Nazi armband has been knocked down by a young boy who's not. I think it's, uh, I like it. It could easily have been, I mean, the artist could have drawn any point in this whole confrontation. Drawing this point really makes you, it draws you into the cover. I like it a lot. Let's see, the cover is by uh, Cesar Saint Martin. I'll have to see who that is, whether or not that person has a website. Uh, but this is uh, a history. This is uh, coming out in early January. Let's see here. We are living in an unprecedented era of opposition. I don't deny that at all, and, uh, but the, the cover tells you right away that this is about resisting the Nazis, opposing the Nazis, and I can't tell you how depressing it is to be an American in 2019 and hear a pub sheet or any or a conversation or a debate or anything start with a sentence like that and know that um, modern Nazis are being considered when opposition is being discussed and that my country is them. That, that we are the bad guy. That, that the thing that's being opposed here is the monster who runs the United States of America. That is so depressing. <laughs> so America in 2019 gets to join Germany as being the you know the stock ready villain only of a new millennium. <sighs> yeah, we are we are in an unprecedented era of opposition because the leader of the United States of America is telling his. Uh, clan followers that he'll pay their legal fees if they beat people up. He's yearning on national TV, on live camera, for a citizenry that does what he says, like the citizenry of North Korea. He's praising the dictator of North Korea, praising the dictator of Russia, <sighs> calling the press the enemy of American people, saying that, that our, our devolving climate is a hoax, uh, calling himself God, <sighs> just recently calling himself God, and having a Auditorium is full of foreigners who are perfectly willing to shout that that is true. People who, until literally yesterday, would have called themselves faithful, God-fearing Christians. You cannot be a faithful, God-fearing Christian if you worship a different God than Jesus Christ. And they now do. The, the, the Trump's next Klan rally, is going. there are going to be people hailing him as God. And he is going to repeat that claim, even though he's been called on it by whatever few advisors he has left. I, uh, anyway, I've gone on a digression about the modern day. We, we should get back to this book. It's just that first line, an unprecedented era of opposition. Yes, to Trump, the president of the United States, to Trump. <laughs> uh, and all the worst presidents elsewhere in the world, all of whom are his friends, whereas his enemies are our allies. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> many news outlets and pundits frequently compare our current times to the rise of the Nazis, yes, and people are taking to the streets to protest in record numbers. Yes, yes, in the United States, Flowers in the Gutter is a compelling story of real-life heroism and resistance, providing YA readers with the perfect mirror of our current political climate of staunch nationalism and ethic dile ethical dilemmas. Flowers in the Gutter is told from the point of view of Gertrude, Fritz, and Jean, three young people from working-class neighborhoods in Cologne, beginning with their preschool years at the dawn of the Third Reich in the 1930s. Daddy shows how political activism was always part of their lives and how they witnessed firsthand the toll it took on their parents and how they still carried the torch for justice when it was their turn. Uh, Flowers in the Gutter is a unique entry in a wave of books about historical contemporary youth resistance. You want, me, you want to impress me with youth resistance? Turn out. 
to vote in 2020. The United States has been gerrymandered by the Republican Party to such a point that only an, a massive turnout of voters can counteract it. You want to impress me with your resistance, a proud resistor, as a hashtag on your Twitter bio. If you want to impress me, turn out in record numbers to vote. Instead of record low numbers, which is what you have done for the last 10 elections. <laughs> so it, 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 the, the youth vote, 18 to 25. If you turn on a greater percentage than, say, 17% out of 100 of registered people, then I'll be impressed. Otherwise, <laughs> keep your hashtag resistance to yourself, okay? Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, Gaddy uses a wide variety of meticulous research German-language primary sources, including the memoirs of the three main characters, uh, to weave a thrilling tale of survival and resistance in the face of fascist violence. The book is also beautifully illustrated by historical photographs of the... the uh, these people in their own day. Uh, well, I wonder if this advanced copy has... Oh, it does. This advanced copy has some of those photos. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, how how grim. Let's, let's see. Let's see if we can see some of our heroes. Uh, yeah, there's one of our heroes in 1944, hero with a guitar. Uh, so these are... I'm, this is an advanced copy from January, so I'm not sure... Uh, if any of these uh, photographs will look different in the finished copy, I guess I guess it'd be a while to find out. Uh, but this is we've seen books like this before: resisting resisting Hitler, resisting the Nazis. Uh, these these have been there's a little vogue of them, and I think the vogue will only increase uh, because you know the publishing industry tries to respond to the modern world. I <sighs> mean. Uh, and in the modern world, we have gigantic forces of fascistic evil taking over countries, including the United States. So there's, uh, uh, there, among other things, not to put it too cynically, but among other things, there's, a, there's now a market for books about resistance. So, uh, whereas, to put it mildly, there was no such market for eight years under our last uh, president, uh, President Obama. There was no, no such market. Uh, so let's let's move on from irate political screeds, since that's not what you come to this channel for. Uh, okay, this next one is uh, mid-November, so this I, I don't have to put off until next year. Uh, and this is by Alan Eskins, and it is nothing more dangerous. Uh, just five years into his esteemed writing career, Alan Eskins has been awarded the Minnesota Book Award, the Barry Award twice, and the Rosebud and Silver Falchion Awards and has been a finalist for the Edgar, Thriller, and Anthony Awards. Uh, he has been at work on his latest novel, Nothing More Dangerous, for over 28 years. So did he start his writing career very late? If he's only five years into it, he must have... Well, uh, I, I don't know anything about him. Uh, well worth the wait. It is his most personal and compelling book yet, the story he became a writer to tell. I'm now, I'm now really curious to know how old this author is. Uh, let's see, he, he lives with his wife in outstate Minnesota, where he has been a practicing criminal defense attorney for 25 years. Okay, so he's not young. Uh, the novel opens in 1976, and protagonist Bodie Sandin can't wait to escape his small rural town nestled in the Ozark Hills. His mother has drawn inward after losing her husband to a tragic accident years earlier, and Bodie feels entirely alone. If he's not overlooked by his classmates, then he's being bullied. Bodie feels as if his life has pushed him to a breaking point, and he starts saving his pennies so that one day soon he can flee his hometown and slip away to someplace bigger and better, any place but Jessup, Missouri. Brody's world is turned upside down when a new family with a son his age moves next door. Coming to know the Elgins, a black family settling in a community where the notions of us and them carry the weight of history, forces Bodie to rethink his understanding of the world he's taken for granted. Okay. All right. Uh, well, this comes out. This comes out in mid-November, uh, so I will be reading it this year. But I don't have to get to it right away. I can wait. I can wait just a bit. That sounds interesting, though. Uh, uh, so let's let's move on to this next one. I'm curious uh, what could be in the box. <laughs> I admit the uh, box is always uh, my greatest curiosity. But uh, so what is? Oh, great. Okay, I have already read this. I really liked it, uh, and I, I think I've mentioned it on this channel before. Uh, this is, uh, translated? No, okay. Uh, this comes out soon. Yes, early September, oh god. This is by Tash Awe, and it is We the Survivors. Uh, 
Um, I think they've got a little bit uh, better lighting than yesterday. This is a novel uh, from a Taiwanese author. Um, let's see here. Do we have... No, no, I do not. Okay, the entire pub sheet is... Uh, Blurbs. <laughs> the entire the entire thing is just blurbs. Uh, great, I suppose. I mean, a, a critic is going to want to know, I guess, some of the advance warnings about this book. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to have to read the book to tell you about it here. Uh, ah Hawk is the name of our hero. Is an ordinary man born in a Malaysian village. After years of menial labor, he has ascended through the ranks at a fish farm and become a model of upward mobility. So what brings him to kill a man? This question leads a young, privileged journalist to Ah Hawk's door. The victim has been mourned, and the killer has served time for the crime. Yet Ah Hawk's motive remains unclear, even to himself. His vivid confession unfurls through interviews with the journalist, herself a local whose life has taken a very different course. This compelling tale illuminates the dark underside of global progress, the brutal conditions, exploited workers, and environmental violence that sustains relentless industry. In We the Survivors, Tosh Aw draws a, quote, measured and moving portrait of a rapidly modernizing Asia. That, that measured and moving part is from the review in the Times Literary Supplement. Confronting the most urgent issues of our moment, this is a work of a writer at the height of his powers. Uh, and Tosh Aw is he's at the height of his powers, but he's very young. And he was born in Taipei uh, and brought up in Malaysia. And is the author of three novels, The Harmony Silk Factory, which won the Whitbread First Novel Award and Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book, and was longlisted for The Man Booker, Map of the Invisible World and Five Star Billionaire, which has been longlisted for The Man Booker in 2013. And he's also the author of a memoir of an immigrant family, The Face, Strangers on a Pier, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Uh, so uh, you, you can tell from that from that biography and also from all of these from all of these blurbs uh, he comes well praised and boy oh boy I love this book I can see where the praise comes from so in early September uh, let's see September 3rd is the date on this but I don't I don't imagine that that's strict in sep oh, September 3rd I, or thereabouts I will write up a review of this thing but I do recommend it you're, it's an, a very involving book you'll, you'll be on your bookstore uh, you know new release tables and you will enjoy it or, or no, uh, note, it, note it and get it from your library uh, and then we'll do, we have, we have two cardboard things here. One is one of these enormous vacuum pack things. Uh, and then the other is a box. Uh, what is this? Finished copy of something. Oh, great. Okay, fantastic. Uh, this is a September book, I'm sure. Good Lord. Yes, this is a September book. Oh, my. Uh, <clears throat> okay. This is by Roll Sturks. And it, we've seen it already. We saw it already. This is the finished copy. It's Ways of Heaven. Uh, an introduction to Chinese thought. This comes out in late September, and it's it's uh, it's a September book, but I have not got to it. I have not got to it yet. I am reading now September at a furious pace and still way behind. <laughs> uh, let's see here. In this book, a uh, leading China scholar, uh, Rolls Sterks, offers a rich overview of classical Chinese ideas and philosophies and explores their enduring influence on China today. Drawing on evocative examples from philosophical texts, literature, and everyday life, the author takes readers through centuries of Chinese history. He introduces major figures and ideas of the Confucian, Taoist, and legalist traditions, sheds lights on key concepts, and examines Chinese approaches to leadership, social order, death, nature, and more. And all of that, I love books like this. I read them all the time. And uh, all of that sounds fantastic. I just... <laughs> I just haven't got to it yet, I, but I am going to, I am confident, I am doing a huge amount of reading these days, and I'm confident that soon, <laughs> relatively soon, I will be able to to stop saying over and over again that all these September books are new to me, that I haven't got to any of them yet. I am now making huge inroads into September. And I, I intend to continue that, so uh, now we do the box, which is heavy. It's probably a number of books or a finished copy of something uh, that's really big. I can only think of a handful of books, but, uh, but that would be this big in a finished copy. But, uh, okay, all right, you don't want me to get into it. Uh, but I have been surprised before, and also, uh, it could be multiple books. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. It's one book. Oh, my. 
It's even bigger than the ways of heaven. Oh, it's bigger than I thought it would be. Okay, this is another book. I think this is also September, and I think, no, this is October 1st. This is another book, and it's also one that I have read and loved. So uh, you have you have We the Survivors, and you have this thing. Oh, my, look at the size of this. Okay, this is by Stephen Harrigan, and this is Big Wonderful Thing, A History of Texas. And it is enormous. It is much bigger than I thought it would be. This is from the University of Texas Press, and it's going to be $35 on the 1st of October, and I am really hoping uh, that it is a hit for the University of Texas because it is amazing. It is an amazing book. I, do, I want to stress uh, that you do not need to be in love with Texas, live in Texas, or have ever been to Texas uh, to love this book. <laughs> this is just narrative history done so well that it will pull you in regardless of whether or not you've ever been uh, Let's see here. You are holding in your hands a review copy of Big Wonderful Thing. Actually, I'm not. I'm holding in my hands a finished copy. Uh, Stephen Harrigan's History of Texas. Uh, when T.R. Fehrenbach's Lone Star, widely considered the standard chronicle, was released in 1968, history was converging on Texas. Lyndon Johnson was trying to hold together an imploding great society as it crashed toward the end of his unexpected presidency. NASA's mission control was directing the Apollo 8 manned spacecraft from Houston. Uh, and the Longhorns were one season away from being the last all-white team to win the N of the NCAA National Football Championship. Uh, Fehrenbach's tome is a monument to his chosen people, as Michael Ennis wrote for Texas Monthly in 2005, the pluckiest, manliest, most devilishly clever bunch of European white males God ever put on this earth. <laughs> Fifty years later, it seems like we're still facing challenges like never before, and many of the flashpoints burn in the Lone Star State. Immigration and human rights, dwindling fossil fuel and water reserves, mega storms, and a rapidly changing climate. Stark economic disparity, the technological boom, the continuing struggle with equity, regardless of your sex, skin color, age, socioeconomic status, and so on. And as we grapple with these issues, we also confront the past. History matters. It nurtures our, our communal identity and encourages us to envision a better future. It reveals our complexities, hones our values, and offers a foundation for our responsibilities to ourselves and each other. I actually couldn't put that any better. That's a perfect way to defend reading history at all, any kind of history. Um, Texas needs a new history, a history that embraces the audacious spirit that endowed the land long before the Europeans came in the 16th century, a new history that embraces all of its people and their unconquerable pride in their defiance of convention a new history that reflects on where we've been to show how we might move forward. Big, wonderful thing is that history. And I wholeheartedly agree. I don't usually wholeheartedly agree with the fulsome praise of a pub sheet, but this is a, just a terrific book. <laughs> just terrific. It never slows. It never forgets that its job is both to instruct you and entertain you. It's just, it deserves to, to supplant all other Texas histories and just become a great work on its own, just become the standard work. Those of you who are uh, who are maybe joining us from outside the United States, I have quite a few viewers who are not in the United States. Uh, okay, so this comes out on October 1st. I have no idea how strict that will be, but in October this will be in bookstores. Uh, but those of you who are joining us from outside, maybe you've never visited the United States, there are certain parts of the United States, you know, I'm, I'm sure that no matter where you are, you view the United States with a mixture of uh, fascination and alarm. <laughs> uh, and there are certain parts of the United States that tend to intensify the United States-ness of the United States. Some, some do not at all. Uh, for instance, uh, most of Iowa or rural Illinois is ordinary small-town life. It's, it's large groups of people enjoying themselves, trying to help each other, going to work, raising their children, uh, adoring their pets going to local concerts, local plays, whatever, having, you know, a relatively intense regional pride, going to regional sporting events. And you could take that description from, you know, rural Wisconsin, rural Illinois, all of Iowa, you could take that description and move it to, you know, to the same small rural towns in, in Ukraine, anywhere in Austria, anywhere across uh, northern France, you could, you could move it there, change its language, but you wouldn't have to change much about it. It's a, those places, and there are huge swaths of them throughout the United States, are completely sane. They're completely sane places. Their inhabitants might get up to weird stuff, but they're, they're normal places. They do not, those places do not accumulate 
the, the weirdness of the country. <laughs> there are only a few places in America that accumulate the weirdness of what America is, that sort of embody both the interesting and the alarming aspects of America. And Texas is one of them. Texas could arguably be called the biggest of them all. There was a, actually an exchange on Twitter that I saw just the other day where a very well-traveled reporter, not as well-traveled as yours truly, but still a very well-traveled reporter said, you know, I hear a lot about state pride, all the 50 states in the United States. I hear a lot about state pride. But I got to tell you, if you rank them one to five in terms of intensity of state pride, uh, number one will be Texas. And number two, three, four, and five will also be Texas. And I, uh, there, he, the, the, the person who made that tweet got some pushback, but I read it and thought, I lived in Texas for, for quite some time, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, it feels disloyal to, to Massachusetts, to Vermont, to Iowa, to New Hampshire, but nevertheless, <laughs> not, Texas definitely coagulates that. In case any of you have not, have not been to America and are curious, our state of Florida is also one of those nodes that coagulates what it means to be in, to be American. Florida tends to coagulate the weird, violent, perverse, and wretched side of it in a way that no other part of the country does. There, there is a uh, a term in the American lexi lexicography, a Florida man, and that th that is meant to to be shorthand for the very weirdest, strangest, darkest, and most violent and most self defeating headlines in American news will always start off with Florida man. <laughs> Florida man accidentally immolates his infant with illegal gun, with illegal fireworks on the 4th of July. Something like that. Or a Florida man uh, loses his arm, uh, his, his left hand to his pet alligator two years after having lost his right hand to his pet alligator. <laughs> something something like that. The, the perverse and weird, the, the National Enquirer type America is often embodied and coagulates in the state of Florida. And a lot of the the uh, bigger and more alarming stuff, the, the my way or the highway, the, you know, if I don't like you, I'll shoot you, the, the, a lot of the stereotypical Hollywood conception of what Americans are comes from Texas. But, but Texas is much more than that. Texas is a world on its own. It was its own country uh, before it became part of the United States. And it is only very lightly part of the United States. And this this book captures all of that, all the voices, not just, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, not just the overlay of triumphant, oil-rich white people, but the whole polyphony. Uh, just, uh, how wonderful. I'm so glad to have this. I'm so glad to have a finished copy. That is great. I cannot recommend this book strongly enough, uh, whether you've been to Texas, whether you like it or know it or not. Uh, so that is that is our mail haul uh, for today, for this bright day. It's going to be very hot today. Uh, so we have a big, wonderful thing in finished copy. Great. I hope that, that the University of Texas distributes this to every bookstore in the country. I hope, I hope that this does well. I really do. There was a book just a couple of years ago on Texas. It was a fraction of this. It was as big as the notes section of this book uh, that did well, but it was by a much better known author. Uh, I, so I, 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 it's, this is a case I often encounter it. I'm sure that if you, if you pay any attention to new releases, you probably encounter it sometimes too. I often encounter a situation where a new release comes along and I want it to do well, which feels almost like a contradiction of a role as a critic, but sometimes you're not neutral. I want this book to do well. It's, this is, this is narrative history done just the way it should be done. And I, so I want it to be in retail bookstores in Iowa and, you know, North Dakota and Montana, and I want it to sell in those stores, so I don't know that it will. This will It will be a regional bestseller. It will be in every regional <clears throat> library in Texas, and the, the Texas library and the Texas school system are powerful enough. I used to work for the Texas school system writing, helping with textbooks. Uh, that system is so powerful that it can actually make a hit out of this book, even if it doesn't sell in Massachusetts. I'm just hoping that it does. I'm hoping that it does. Uh, so we have that. That is the that was the big box. Then we have uh, Ways of Heaven, an introduction to Chinese thought and philosophy. Uh, we have We the Survivors by Tosh Ha. Uh, uh, courtroom drama, really, at the heart of the book is a courtroom drama. Terrific novel. Just terrific. And then some forthcoming things. We have Nothing More Dangerous, which uh, is an Ozark novel that arrives in mid in mid-November, so towards the end of the year. And then Flowers in the Gutter, uh, YA history, 
full of illustrations, full of black and white illustration uh, of kids rising up against fascism. So uh, even even young adults that you know who aren't typically interested in history probably will find this interesting. And you notice it's also designed. It's full of illustrations, and it has an illustration on the cover instead of a faded sepia tone photo. The the people uh, at Dutton have gone to every level of effort to make this appealing to younger readers. I think that's great. It's hardly ever done. <laughs> it's hardly ever done. It's hard enough to get young readers to read anything, much less to get them to read history. Uh, so I'm I'm. This is another one where I'm championing. I'm glad that it's going that it's going to be out in the world, and I'm hoping that it does well. Uh, but that that is our mail for today. I don't know uh, if we're going to get more mail. Today, this is this is going to be yet another day where the bean and I spend most of it cooped up because it's going to be boiling hot outside. It's going to be 92, 93 degrees Fahrenheit outside today. It looks like it'll be the last such day for quite some time, maybe for the rest of the summer. But when it's like that, by two in the afternoon, the, the sidewalks themselves have become so hot that it's uncomfortable for Frida to walk on them, you know, with her with her bare little toesies. <laughs> so, and also the heat beating down on her. We have to keep our walks short and constrained, and that that tends to, to frustrate her. She's a very active little dog. Tends to frustrate me too. I'm an active big dog. <laughs> uh, but w once that's over, we'll go on longer walks, and I will take you along. Because one thing that I remember from last week, one thing a memory that is sticking with me, is how much I enjoyed vlogging. How much I enjoyed taking the camera and going out and filming little bits and pieces of of something other than me on the couch. I think I'm going to do more of that. Like there are, once the weather is cooperative, I can't do that if I'm worried about Frida overheating. So summer has to be on the wane, <laughs> but summer I think is on the wane. So anyway, that's a long digression. That was our that was our mail. This, this includes a novel that I can recommend and also an enormous history that I can recommend. Big uh, this this thing is so good. Big wonderful thing is so good uh, that I when it comes out in October, you should give it a try. And now we're in we're in uh, late mid, late October, August, go to your library and make sure that they order a copy. <laughs> Tell them that you have it on the most impeccable authority in the world, that it will appeal to all of their patrons, even if they are not a library in Texas. And if you are in a small community in Texas, first of all, I want to hear from you, because <laughs> I used to live in Austin. Uh, but if you're in a small community or a middling a middle, middling community in Texas, the big communities will all get this. But if your library doesn't have this on order, if they have not... Uh, you know, coughed up the dough to buy a copy of this thing, make sure they do. <laughs> Sit on them until they do. <laughs> anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.